to Ion Horror, the official podcast of iHorror.com. This is episode 120, otherwise known as season seven, episode one. Woo! Seven seasons. Woohoo! I'm your host, James J. Edwards, and with me, as always, again, back for another season, is your other host, Jacob Davison. How you doing, Jacob? Uh, doing good. Just trying to stay away because it is a chilly morning in California. <laughs> We're such wimps. It has been raining pretty good for us, though, the last oh, yeah. few days. Yeah, there, there's some hardcore flooding down here. I don't know about you guys. Uh, also with us, as always, is your other other host, John Korea. How you doing, Korea? Oh, I'm wide the fuck awake. I'm excited. We hit Rick Berman era Star Trek level seasons, seven seasons. <laughs> well, nice. That's awesome. I went for a run. I, I joined. A, you guys, we've been gone for so long. I joined a fucking running group and I <laughs> hate it. I hate that. I don't hate it enough. Um, I now know the, 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 you know, when people talk about cults and stuff uh, and they say the people who say they're not going to join a cult are the ones that are most susceptible to joining a cult. I get it now because I, I, everything about a running group sounds appalling to me, socializing and running. Ugh. But uh, yeah, I'm into it now. So um, yeah, I don't know who I am anymore. I'm I'm 30, 33, and I, I don't know what's happening with my life anymore. Yeah, just make sure at the end of the weeks of running that they don't like offer you to an altar like they midsummer your ass. Yeah, no, it's attached to a it's attached to a it's a shoe store doing it. So if anything, they might just try to sell me some shoes. <laughs> yeah, yeah they, it's actually kind of brilliant marketing. <laughs> it, it really yeah, is. All your shoes are all run down from all that running. Well, I guess you got to buy some new shoes. No, it's, it's more like, oh, you started a running club. Your shoes aren't good enough for running. Dude, it, no, it, it, it genuinely is like a really good like thing. They're yeah, like, it's an it eight is. week program. It's 50 bucks. Like, you know, we just meet twice a week. It's it's super chill. Everyone's nice. You know, like it's yeah. You know, <laughs> we're we're getting matching sweatsuits. Suit. Oh, shit. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah, no, the sweatsuits is, is the big giveaway. What is it? Uh, King of the Hill when he pulls up, he's like, is this the cult? No, we're a group of free loving. Blah, blah. Yep, this is it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we've been gone so long. I actually had COVID and came back. Oh, yeah. First time? I know. Huh? First, it was it first? first yeah, that's the first time I've had it. And honestly, I think I had a pretty mild case because it just felt like a really bad cold to me. Mm. But yeah, I had to isolate for a couple of weeks and I watched a lot of comfort movies like Cocaine Bear and Barbie and all that. But <laughs> I did get some new watching in and, um, I, let's rip the band-aid off on what we've watched uh recently did either of you guys see night swim i did not no you did? Oh, oh my no, gosh covid numbers have been crazy so we haven't been going to the movies that much you know i figured out i i either got it at my screening of night swim or the next week i saw mean girls and something i also want to talk about the beekeeper but anyway i got <laughs> it I got it at one of the screenings, I think. But anyway, Night Swim. Um, it's pretty much a typical Blumhouse January release. It is a really <laughs> slick movie. It's really well made. But the story is just, I mean, it is exactly what you think it is. It's about a haunted pool. Yeah. And um, the short film that it's, that it's kind of um, not really adapted from, I guess, expanded off of is actually really cool. You can find it on YouTube. And it's really it's really cool. And it's also kind of a scene from the movie. But the movie itself, the backstory behind what's going on, it, it, it's let down by its script because it's pr a pretty well-made movie as far as like, you know, it, it's well acted. Cinematography is they do some really cool water stuff like, you know, in the pool and then you come out of the pool. You know, there, there's some cool water photography and stuff. It's just, you know, you it. it the, it can't get out of its own story's way you know it's ah. anyways so you didn't like amityville pool house that much <laughs> <laughs> amityville pool house that that would have been a better name for I mean, well not a better name for it but uh oh. <laughs> it wouldn't have surprised me one bit if it went straight to video and called itself amity pool <laughs> mm -hmm. but now okay let's talk about the beekeeper tell Ooh, me the you beekeeper. guys have seen the beekeeper Protect yeah. the hive. Oh, you have not. Oh, my God. You've seen it, though, Jacob. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I oh, saw my God. IMAX. The beekeeper. 
it is the most ridiculously fun movie I think I've seen in a long time. I cannot remember a movie that is so in on its own joke because it's a typical Jason Statham movie. But the thing is, he's on this vengeful rampage and the people he's rampaging against are people who I mean, there's a little more to it, but they basically scammed an old lady friend of his out of her life savings with one of those, you know, one of those pop up on your computer saying, call this number to disinfect. And um, yeah. Oh, my God. And it, it is it's just the most ridiculously violent and action packed. And I was giddy the whole time. And the thing is, there's a lot of people hating it. There are a lot of people who are just oh, yeah. the stupidest movie ever made. It's like, dude. And that's fine. Well, and also lighten up a little. This movie yeah. is it's not trying to be Citizen Kane. This movie is trying to be basically a Jason Statham movie. And be, the the beekeeper is this will tell you how kind of silly this movie is. Beekeepers are CIA operatives that are basically like Jason Bourne. They just they they just kick all kinds of ass and they're almost invincible. But he is also a literal beekeeper. Yeah, oh, he yeah, does, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he does keep, yeah. he keep bees. He keeps the bees. <laughs> yeah, he does keep bees. But it's funny because they like, like Jacob was saying, they they really lean into the beekeeper metaphor. He's like, oh, I'm protecting the hive. You know, it's, mm-hmm. oh, oh my god, I had so much fun with it. But yeah, there's a lot of hate. What did, what did you think? Take tell me you had as much fun with it as I did. He yeah, keeps I really the dug bees. it. I'm sorry. Just Jacob, oh, you... just Jacob going, he keeps the bees. He's the beekeeper. He keeps the bees. Oh, I love it. I love it. Uh, yeah, no, I, I had a lot of fun with it. I saw it in IMAX, and it does have a lot of impressive fight choreography. And Jason Statham just basically having a bee stick, like he even throws a jar of honey at an assassin at one point, and it's flammable. So he sets her on fire with it. And yeah, no, just it's kind of setting up this whole thing with like these beekeepers are uh, like these, uh, yeah, Jason Bourne, John Wick type super assassins. And Jeremy Irons plays like the head of security for like the uh, prime boss guy who's in charge of the scamming thing. And of course he does. He, he, yeah. <laughs> and, and, it, and it's funny too, because like I thought he, he's also like a former head of the CIA. So I felt like he was doing a Donald Rumsfeld impression, doing like, oh, oh you've done it now. You fucked with the beekeeper. Yeah. Well, and also, his um, the, the new head of the CIA is played by Minnie Driver. And, um, and he, call, he calls her for help. And she's all, and when she finds out it's the beekeeper, she's all, I can't help you. <laughs> like, like she's yeah. even afraid of the guy. There's uh, one awesome scene at a gas station where, um, yeah, the, this, assa- the assassin, the, they send the other bee, another beekeeper to try to take him out. Yeah. They send another beekeeper. And oh, it's that funny because like, done. At, while they're uh, fighting, um, she, she, she says something. She's all, you, you must be, you know, says his name. She identifies him. He goes, you must be my replacement, you know, cause he's retired. And, yeah. And then they they shoot up and burn up this gas station. It's oh like it's just so ridiculously awesome. Yeah, and also it's funny because it's set largely around Springfield, Massachusetts. Even though uh, there's bayous, because I presume they shot in Louisiana or something. Well, I mean there there are some swampy parts of like southern New Hampshire, but like Springfield's not that swampy, you know. Uh, nah, uh, but it it is just kind of funny when they. Uh, said an action movie like this uh, back in the home state. Um, but yeah, no, it's just Jane Statham, B theme. There you go. It sounds like a B movie with like <laughs> a B movie, <laughs> uh, but with like a good budget. Like it seems like it has like oh, yeah. a good budget for like all it's a it was all David it's, Ayer. Yeah, but it has that like training day. You be David Ayer from Suicide Squad. Oh, pff, yeah. Was it? Did he do Cop Shop? Was it? Uh, uh, no, I don't think that was the same guy. Oh, I thought it was because uh, that that one was very like B movie premise, but like had a decent enough budget to like kind of like step above it, but was like very of that feel. It, it sounds awesome. Uh, no, that was Joe Carnahan. Joe Carnahan. I always I always confuse those two for some reason. Um, but speaking of Jeremy Irons, uh, at the end of last year. Because I've been pushing Lindsay to do this because I bought the, I tracked down a German Blu-ray of the third one because I found a really cheap copy of the first two. 
We watched the uh, first three Dungeons and Dragons movies. Oh, and shit. let me tell you, Jeremy Irons in that first Dungeons and Dragons movie. I understand that there was a lot of CGI and stuff, but that man still chewed so much fucking scenery. It is. I it, Does he chew? Does, so in Beekeeper, does he chew up a lot of scenery in that? Because that's oh, yeah. my favorite Jeremy Irons. You just give him some some like really cheesy stuff to just like really gnaw on. And he delivers it with such pat. I love it. I, I think all the entire cast knows what kind of movie they're making. Yeah. So yeah, there's, there's a level of self-awareness. Yeah. There's a lot of that because uh, um, the old woman who, who uh, gets scammed by the people, it's Felicia Rashad. Huh. Okay. And she's, you know, I, I, I feel like everyone there knew what kind of movie they're making. It's just, a lot of the audience didn't realize the kind of movie they make it, you know, the audience yeah. members who aren't liking it. Cause I was sitting next to a couple of other critics in, in my screening and they're both like, Oh, this is the dumbest movie ever. And I'm like, dude, no, just enjoy it. And you will, <laughs> if you let yourself enjoy it, you will. I just, Oh, I thought it was so much fun. Yeah, I mean, he- it's not going to end up on my top 10 list by any stretch, but you know, for what like it, it is, get a sequel. Yeah. Is it going to get a sequel? I mean, I said I would like it to get us. Oh, OK, it it could. It's doing well at the box office yeah. uh, for January. And it probably and it does sound like one of those type of movies that's going to find a bigger audience on home video and Netflix or something. Uh, but back to Dungeons and Dragons, that first one is still not good. Uh, but the second one, Wrath of the Dragon God, if you play D&D, which I don't. But if you do, that is a movie made for you. Like that is straight up. You're watching nerds playing D&D and these characters are acting it out. It's great. Um, you do, don't you don't need to seek out the third one. The third one is borderline <laughs> unwatchable. Uh, I almost kind of regret putting so much effort in tracking down the very hard to get Blu-ray that I got for it. But um, but it was still fun to watch, like see like what's been done before, you know. Um, yeah, and Honor Among Thieves was awesome. And I really hope we get a sequel to that. Yeah, no, I, I, it made me appreciate honor. Like honor among thieves is really good for like bringing in people that aren't super into the D and D world. But like uh, wrath of the dragon God is very good at just being like full on in that world. But even someone like me who has like very limited knowledge of it was like, could still keep up and understand and like enjoy it. And yeah, it's a lot of fun. Uh, yep. Speaking of a lot of fun, I was at uh, an incredible uh, premiere uh, in January for a new horror movie. Ooh, uh, do tell. They, yeah, they released uh, the movie Destroy All Neighbors at the Arrow Theater as a part of Beyond Fest. Did, uh, have either of you guys seen it? No, but I heard really good things about it. Isn't um, what's It's on this? Shudder, right? Yeah, it's on Shudder. Uh, it was directed by Josh Forbes, stars Jonah Ray and Jonah Alex Ray, Winter. Yeah. Uh, basically, it's about Jonah Ray as this uh, kind of near to well guy who's trying to be a prog rock star and he keeps on being neurotic about finishing his album. And he lives in this really crappy apartment with his uh, devoted girlfriend. And then this new neighbor moves in, play, uh, played by Alex Winter, who's basically this Eastern European troll man named Vlad. And uh, <laughs> needless to say, the title does happen and uh, a lot of neighbors do get accidentally destroyed and murdered and dismembered and <laughs> blown up and stabbed and uh shit goes crazy and it was one of the uh, one of the best screenings i've been to uh this year so far and it's it's just a lot of fun and it has that kind of uh kind of coen brothers dark comedy element to it but with sam raimi level of uh splat stick and actually no uh one of the writers of the movie uh charlie piper uh, we went to college together so it, it was just wild to see it finally premiere it finally uh come out after hearing him talk about it uh all these years and yeah no it's just it's it's, it's so much fun. Like I, I really would recommend it. It's, uh, you know, just you know, very, very much a throwback splat stick movie with a lot of practical effects. And again, you know, if you're a fan of Freaks, uh, Alex Winter does go full Goblin Man. Oh, that's awesome. I just got um, a couple of gray market VHS tapes, including uh, Freak on it. Um, 
Yeah, that, I'm pretty stoked about that. Also, I, I got the complete snuff box series on VHS. Most of these I already own on DVD, so I'm, I'm not being bad guys and getting gray market stuff for things I legally bought. But yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> I know that uh, the last couple of years, I have said that uh, pretty early on in the year, like that two years ago, it was St. Maud. And this year is Cocaine Bear. I call that my favorite movie of the year is like in the first part of the year. And I think I'm doing it again this year because I saw what it's at least going to be on my top 10 might be my number one. Have you guys seen ISS? No, uh, no. But I saw the trailer for it before uh, minus one. And I was like, holy shit, I love that concept. That's a great it, concept. It is. It's. Oh, yeah. It's, I, I loved it. It's basically if, if you haven't seen the trailer before Godzilla minus one, um, it's basically about the International Space Station. And there's three Americans and three Russians on this space station doing their work. And while they're up there, a nuclear war happens down on Earth. And the Americans who you're you're seeing it through their eyes, the Americans get a message saying, you know, hey, there's a situation down here. Um, we need you to take control of the station by any means necessary. And then they look over to the Russians and the Russians are reading their communications and the Russians look over at them. So they know they got the same message. So basically there's this crew of the space station and they're also, they're like family because these guys spend months on yeah. end up there together. And all of a sudden they don't know who they can trust and who they can't trust. And, you know, do, do they really need to take over this space station or, you know, should they just all six of them blow it off and just keep doing what they're doing? And, you know, there's no support from the ground anymore because the planet is a wreck and it's just really, uh, it's a real tense, it's a tense exercise and paranoia is what it is because yeah. these guys, because they've also forged relationships between each other. So they're like, okay, but no, I, this, th these people are my friends. These are my family. Yeah. Are they really going to try to kill me to take control of this station? It's yeah, it's my, my one issue with it is and this isn't really that big of an issue but it it, it kind of leaves you hanging at the end and i won't go into any more specifics sure. about it because i don't want to be spoiled but it's it i won't say there's no resolution but there it it doesn't end as satisfyingly as it could but i also understand why it doesn't because of the situation that it's yeah. all in but it is it, it's kind of it, the way that it's shot reminds me of gravity where you know mm -hmm. it, it, they're in zero gravity just like sandra bullock was and i don't know how they shot it if they did it like in water like she did or if maybe they used one of those vomit comet planes to shoot um Ugh. but it's uh just getting two minutes of footage I, at a fucking time <laughs> going up and down Ugh. yeah uh, yeah on a complete space station set but uh they do yeah, it sometimes i think they i think they did that with apollo 13 um if i'm not mistaken they had like tom crew or tom hanks and the and them go doing vomit comet stuff, getting shots like thirty seconds at a time. Yeah, going up and down. Uh, when you have a budget. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. When you can rent the vomit comet. <laughs> yeah, though I actually heard mixed things about ISS, so I w I didn't really go out of my way to see it, but yeah, maybe I'll give it a shot. Oh, I loved it. I'm super stoked for it because. That was one of my things as a kid. You know, when you're a kid and you latch on to like one weird, like very specific thing, the ISS uh -huh. was my thing for a bit yeah, where okay. like I was just reading about it because even as a kid, I thought that was the coolest thing. It was like the most neutral ground at, out that possible. And it's like the spot where like literally nations are like working together. It's it's an international space station. Like they're all it, there's parts from America and China, like all these places that I normally don't get along all get along in this one spit one spot in like the most hostile spot <laughs> you can be in the atmosphere and i always thought that was really cool so the second that that idea is introduced of like shit's going down down here you need to take the iss and then the other side gets it too it's like oh there's so much that could go wrong with that so like my my brain immediately started going through oh what's this scenario oh what about this scenario oh what if what if someone just says fuck it and just breaks a glass or something like you know like ah oh, like yeah, so I I thank you for reminding me. I need to seek out a screening of that soon. One of the one of the more memorable scenes for me, at least, is um, they're up there, and one of the astronauts is new, 
and and she's looking out the, this portal and they're all looking at earth and all of a sudden the nice blue of the earth starts kind of turning red and they start seeing these little flashes around you know on the land and once it once they realize someone realizes what's going on and goes don't look get away from that window don't look you know because they realize that shit's going on and that that's when they start getting the um the correspondence that says you know take the station but Uh yeah oh that's so cool it was it was great and the thing is it's so grounded in reality it's not like life where you know they get this alien you know thing in there i mean it's you could see this happening you know i mean because what else would happen if because the iss is considered um God, how, how do you say it? not not prime real estate, but like a, um, a an asset, a prime asset that both sides in this war want. So and that's why they're saying take it by any means necessary. You know, both Russia and America want this station. Yeah. And it's not owned by one because everyone mm, kind no. of contributes to it. I actually made a, mo- a scale model of the ISS out of not Legos, but it was uh, what is the other one? Construct where it's more like the the clicking in pieces and stuff it had moving parts and made noises uh yeah yeah i was i was that nerd <laughs> yeah so um so yeah during break i got i watched a whole bunch of documentaries uh one of the first ones i watched was uh tab hunter confidential which was a documentary about tab hunter uh the uh closeted actor in the 50s and 60s um who had a like a later resurgence with john waters films like polyester and stuff um that was a really great one to watch um but more in the horror side of things i finally watched uh king on screen which is a documentary where it's filmmakers who adapted stephen king novels talk about other stephen king movies um and that premise is really cool and it's really interesting having like frank durbont talk about not only shawshank and uh, the mist, but also talk about other people's works within it and how all these filmmakers like have that understanding of what um, what makes King novels work and especially like what it takes to adapt them. Um, they do talk about The Shining and they do talk about like how The Shining is a really good Stanley Kubrick movie, but it's a really bad Stephen King <laughs> movie because uh and, and they go into really great detail where it's like yeah no that 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 makes sense um but yeah it's got everyone mike flanagan tom uh, holland they uh interview so many my only and it's not even like real complaint i was just a little confused is like it opens up with like a little short movie that's like uh like this character going through and there's like a bajillion stephen king references throughout it and it goes on for seven minutes which was just like and it was cool, but I wasn't expecting that. So like, I was like, oh, it's a little intro thing. Oh, it's, oh, it's still going. Uh, did, did, did I pop in the wrong movie? You know? So, uh, but other than that, yeah, King on screen. If you're a big Stephen King fan or Stephen King movies, highly recommend it. And then um, the other one was uh, Living with Chucky. Have you guys heard of that one? Uh, yeah, I think I've heard about it. Yeah, that one's really cool. It was uh, made by... Um, the daughter of one of the uh, main Chucky puppeteers uh, and creators who has been on it since I believe Bride. And so uh, a good portion of the movie is going through the franchise, talking with all the people that were like heavily involved in all that. And then about three quarters of the way through it, she kind of turns the camera a bit on herself and, and how like this like found family within like the Chucky make filmmaking uh, group came to be in like, her being introduced in kind of, again, living with Chucky, like the title. Um, and I really enjoyed it. It was really good. Uh, it was really nice seeing like this progression, but also seeing a lot of stuff that isn't typically talked about with filmmaking, you know, the long hours and how that has effect on families and stuff, but like, you know, and, and how the families deal with it. There was a, a lot of really good there. And I was really shocked because um, I watched a, I tried to watch another documentary about the movie clue and that filmmaker put him put too much of himself into it. Like he, he, that one, he had like the camera on him while he was driving. And he's like, I know what you're thinking. Why would someone make a movie about clue? And it's like, cause clues a great fucking movie. Like I'm surprised <laughs> no one has done it before. And he like, he just kept doing that a lot. And it made me like, and the audio was bad. And I was just like, I can't finish this. This is, this is making me hurt a little bit. 
So I was, I was, I, it made me weary about documentaries about movies. So living with Chucky definitely brought me back to the genre, which is great. Um, and then lastly, um, cause I finished DS9, I got into, uh, what we left behind, which is the documentary looking back at it. That one's really good, especially if you love DS9, but it's also really interesting because they have, uh, not, they're not only looking back and interviewing a lot of people, including Jeffrey Combs, as we know, uh, who played like, six different parts in DS9, uh, <laughs> including the best Wayun. But um, they they have the writers come back and try to figure out, okay, like you're in the writer's room and they're going, all right, so we're coming back for another season. It's X amount years later. What are we starting off with? All right, we're going to start with this characters at this point in, this, in their career. We're doing this. And it was like really cool just seeing like a writer's room work. And then it was really sad because when the day ended and they're like, all right, that's episode one. And we're not making this. Okay. Great seeing everybody. And it was just like, uh, <laughs> I know it was just an exercise, but like, I want that season. <laughs> we can dream, Jonathan. We can dream. Ah, someday. Yep. And on that note, and speaking of esteemed character actor Jeffrey Combs, last night, uh, me and Jonathan were at a uh, big revival screening of Stuart Gordon's Reanimator in honor of the release of his new book. Which Stuart Gordon wrote, right? Like it, 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 it is like, uh, yeah. Well, yeah. I think, yeah. I think he he wrote it. It's his, me- is it's a is his memoir. Like I've got the book right here. It says a memoir by Stuart Gordon. Okay. So yeah, I think it it was that, and also has con- contributions. You know, like forward and afterward. Uh, uh. So yeah, no, I think it's all uh, pretty much from him. I haven't had the chance to really start reading it yet. I I read a little bit because. With the screening, they had the book signing at like 530, but the movie didn't start till seven. So I had a little bit of time to like start the beginning of it in between. Uh, but man, what a what a great uh, screening that uh, the Egyptian and Air uh, and American Cinematheque with uh, Dark Delicacies did. because And Beyond was, Fest. And Beyond Fest. There was a lot of people involved, which is understandable because it wasn't just Jeffrey Combs there to sign it because he did the special. But Barbara Crampton was there to sign it. And then they had it pre-signed by Mick Garris, um, Stuart Gordon's wife, um, the screenwriter. like Dennis Paoli. Dennis Paoli. So like when you got the book, there was already like three or four signatures in there. And mm-hmm. then Barbara and Je- and Jeffrey did. And then um, after and then the 35 print was beat up, but it was still awesome. And it was uh, uncut. It was the uncut version. And then afterwards, they brought out Brian Yuzna, um, Barbara and Jeffrey. And then um, Dennis the, Paoli. Dennis Paoli. I'm it's early um <laughs> and they did a, a really nice q a which went really well although god damn it why did that one the guy opened it up to the audience to to ask questions he's like let's all be nice and like not you know say anything stupid and of course the guy who's fe- feverishly raising his hand goes come on we have to talk about the head scene and it's like bud no no we don't you that was don't awkward think- yeah, you don't think that these people are kind of sick of talking about it? Barbara handled that question mag- oh, yeah, uh, she magnificently. She's cool. When is she coming out with a memoir? Because she subtly dropped that she grew up with in the carnivals. Um, yeah. During the Q&A. Like, where's that memoir? I'd read it. I'd read the shit out of it. Yeah. Uh, and I stuck around afterward and made a double feature that night by watching the 1981 animated classic Heavy Metal, which... Ew animal yeah yeah you know what i'm about and <laughs> let me just say that restaurant it, it must have been a new restoration or something because i have never seen heavy metal look or sound as amazing as it did blasted from the high-tech sound system of the egyptian theater it was an experience oh, it must be the new 4k restoration because they just put that out last year oh shit i didn't know that so yeah it was probably the 4k because it was uh, mind blowing, and uh, you know, just being able to hear like Sammy Hagar, Blue Oyster Cold, and Black Sabbath and stuff at cheap that trick. level of audio quality. Oh, sorry, and Cheap Trick. Oh yeah, Cheap Trick. Well, I mean, it, there's too many to count. <laughs> Devo, a, Devo. Yes, <laughs> it's a big list, man. Classic uh, soundtrack. Yeah. Such oh yeah, no, one. an amazing soundtrack. And and Canada's finest, including John Candy, Eugene Levy, Harold Ramis, Ivan Reitman. Was it a Canadian yep. production? Like, uh, I believe it was. Or yeah, were, like, wasn't it like Nelvana or like a, a, a Canadian animated company? 
I don't know, but like listing off those days, I'm like, it's either a Canadian production or someone was really into SCTV, which a lot of people are, you know, so. I don't yeah, know. well, I mean, SCTV rules. But if it was a Canadian production, wouldn't Brian Adams have been on the soundtrack? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Wait, is Rush not on the soundtrack? No, I don't think they are. Damn, I'm offended about that. I'm offended. Uh, but no, that that the 4K set that they put out last year is really dope. And they did a um, limited uh, steelbook that had the 4K of heavy metal and then included uh, Blu-ray for heavy metal 2000, which is also still a lot of fun. Um, I mean, it does have Michael Ironside. Yeah, <laughs> which is always awesome. True, true. He does elevate any exploitation movie he's in. Oh, man. Starship Troopers. When he comes back and he goes from like the nice recruiter to just being like, the fuck are you doing here? Oh, it's so good. Oh. Yeah. And I, I just rewatched Hello, uh, Mary Lou Prom Night 2, where he's the uh, the crusty principal. This, I need to stop this prom. <laughs> yeah, no, just he, he, he's great and everything, really. I also kind of did some documentary binging, you know, with with my covid brain. And um, one of the things that I watched, which I swear I had seen it before, but I don't remember any of it. So I don't think I did. Chariots of the Gods from, from the 70s. Have you guys seen that? Oh, God. Uh, I've seen clips. <laughs> yeah. it, basically, it basically talks about how um, it, it its thesis is that early humans, you know, like it, it, the Egyptians and the Mayans and all were visited by UFOs and it's kind of it, it's real exploitative. It's like, you know, Leonard Nimoy's in search of kind of a thing, yeah, you know, because yeah. it is from 1970. So, yeah, you know, it has that whole, you know, Bigfoot Bermuda Triangle vibe. to yeah. it. But yeah. it's it, it was it's it's kind of fun. And it reminds and I always think of that quote from the thing. Remember where Palmer's like chariots of the gods, man, uh, the aliens basically own South America. Yeah. <laughs> See, <laughs> the thing is, is that chariots of the god is like, fun as a think piece you know as like a what if you know and then ancient <laughs> aliens just like drove it into the fucking ground yeah like, yeah basically the entire thesis of like aliens visiting um uh, uh early man is yeah we don't believe that these people could have done that we don't oh, believe yeah, that yeah. we don't believe yeah. that the, that knowledge that the, the, these people had uh, uh could have been lost due to time uh and so it has to be aliens because there's no way that these can do it. And it's typically white people doing it uh, towards other yeah. cultures. So it comes off very gross. But there are some interesting things like why does every culture have dragons? And it's like, well, it's possible that they thought UFOs were uh, dragons because they didn't understand, you know, vehicles like that. And it's like, that's a fun thought. Can't prove it, but it's a fun thought, you know. Yeah, it makes sense to me. But yeah, no, I mean, I, I completely agree that. Yeah, the, at this at this point, it's yeah, it's kind of it is kind of offensive just to say that like every major ancient civilization had aid from uh, aliens because nobody says that about the Europeans. Like nobody thinks uh, like the Roman Empire had help from aliens. Yeah, I just hit that episode of Voyager and I was like, Ugh. <laughs> oof, tattoo. Yeah, that second season's a bit rough in it. Uh, yeah, I haven't I haven't watched a lot of Voyager. Um, on another note, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention with, with recapping January that January was, of course, January Giallo. So I watched a lot of Italian horror movies last month. What was your favorite? Oh, that's that is a tough one. But uh, I was at the Sergio Martino double feature at the Egyptian. So that was pretty fun. They did uh, Torso and the Strange Vice of Mrs. Ward and both very solid giallos and both integral to the DNA of the subgenre and also the building blocks of what would eventually become the slasher movie, particularly Torso. Um, yeah. And, and also Sergio Martino was great. Like they actually, he actually flew in from Italy and it, it was funny because he was blown away that, you know, just like the, these kind of genre movies that he did that at their time were kind of seen as sleazy or below art were now so beloved. So he said something to the effect of, well, it looks like in the end I won and he did. <laughs> and, I love that. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, no, the, and yeah, no, there was some 
solid screenings last month and just some stuff I watched on my own uh, outside of that. Like uh, the pr- probably the wildest one I saw it was more kind of Giallo influence, but it was this uh, speaking of Canuxploitation, uh, this Canadian kind of Giallo influence movie called Stone Cold Dead with uh, Richard Crenna and Phantom of the Paradise is Paul Williams, where it's like about a black glove sniper who uh, snipes and takes photographs of prostitutes that they shoot. And Paul Williams plays a uh, crime boss and pimp named uh, Julius Kane. Or sorry, Julius Kurtz. I need to seek this movie out. What's it called again? Stone Cold Dead. Stone it's Cold on Dead. Tubi. Ooh. Yeah. You know, no, I definitely need to watch that. Yeah, no, it's a lot of fun. Um, and yeah, no, and it, it is kind of funny because there are a couple of either Canadian set or just kind of uh, Canadian shot Giallo movies that I've noticed over the years. You know, just whenever, you know, you want to shoot North America and you want to go north. Yeah. You want a cheaper Detroit? Go to Vancouver. Well, enough catch up. Let's move on to our topic, which it, to start the year, we're going to talk about what we are excited about for this year, um, which uh, is not Night Swim. <laughs> well, that already came out. I like I, I can't say Mean Girls. Like I, I do want to see Mean Girls, but it's already out, so I can't. Mean, mean Girls is a lot of fun. Mean Girls is cool. But anyway, uh, what are, what are you guys excited about that's coming out this year, horror wise? Yeah, it's funny because you know just a lot of this stuff you know we just kind of hear about or you know have very small previews for. But I have to say, in terms of marketing hooking me in. Uh, Oz Perkins Long Legs uh, has now become probably my most anticipated horror movie of the year because good God, that marketing campaign was terrifying. I wanted to talk about the marketing campaign for Long Legs because I don't know anything about the movie except basically not even I haven't even watched the trailer, but just from the posters are doing it. And also the promotion emails they're sending back. Keep quoting Bang a Gong. It's like dressed in back. Don't look back. And I love you. You know, and I'm like. Dude, this is like creepy. I don't know a yeah. thing about the movie, but it's yeah. got me. Oh, and the teasers give nothing. They like even the first few teasers they did didn't even give the fucking name of it. Uh, like yeah. it just put gibberish up there. It was great. Um, and I think they finally were like, okay, so the movie's called Daddy Love, or it's called Long Legs, and it's got um <laughs> Nicolas Cage and um fuck, what's your name from its follow? Um Micah Monroe. Micah Monroe, yeah. And it's got these two people in it. Anything else? Oz Perkins wrote and directed it. Okay, what else? You don't need anything else. Just look at these creepy images. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah, no, that, that I'm very, I have no idea what the fuck that is. I've watched every trailer and I still have no idea. And I'm, yeah, so pumped. Um, Did you guys hear about stop motion? I just found out about. Oh, yeah, one. yeah. I saw the I saw, uh, the clips on that. It It looks very interesting. I mean, I'm I'm always stoked for a new stop motion animation uh, project. And so you you got me hooked with uh, a stop motion horror movie. So I'm in that. That's all I need <laughs> for that to be my anticipated. I think one of my most anticipated um, is these strangers movies that they're that they're doing. Really? I guess the I guess chapter one is coming out this year, but oh yeah, I'm looking totally forward to those. What you you I'm I'm just skeptical. I mean, love Rennie Harlan, you know, um early Rennie Harlan. Rennie Harlan hasn't you know kind of put out a decent thing in a while. I then I guess I'm just always skeptical when it's like we're doing this really cheap, but we're doing three of them at once. That that that's for me, it's like ugh. You, you like know, Fear Street, though. I do love Fear Street, but like I know that Fear Street got a budget. You know what I mean? It, uh, I got the budget for it. I don't know. I guess I'm skeptical. You know, like I like I, I hope it's good. Don't get me wrong. I'm not rooting against anybody ever, you know, um, and uh, but I, I am reserved. Like I'm, I'm I'm trying to not get hyped for that because uh, I don't want to I don't want to be hurt. That's all. <laughs> Fair enough. Um. 
Also, in terms of uh, original horror this year, I'm very excited for Tarot, which um, I hadn't even heard about, but I saw the trailer recently, and it has uh, all the monsters designed by uh, Trevor Henderson, the uh, horror artist behind, uh, you know, kind of online cryptids like Siren Head. So I think it's an interesting twist on that kind of uh, motif and it's it's kind of like a neon maniacs thing where I just feel like they're just gonna cram as many monsters into it as possible. So, you know, I can get behind that. <laughs> that sounds awesome. Um I'm big on sci fi right now. So I gotta say, like a lot of my uh anticipated are sci fi's obviously Dune Part Two. Like, look, come on. Mm-hmm. Who isn't mm-hmm. even more hyped after they after the internet went crazy over that popcorn bucket? <laughs> that everyone wants to fuck, you know, but, um, dude, part two looks awesome. Um, and then for, for other sci-fi I, monkey man, where the fuck did that come oh, from? Oh yes. Although I don't yeah. think, I don't think it's really sci-fi, but I mean, it's an awesome looking action movie. Yeah. It, I, well, I mean, I guess it, I guess it's action with maybe a little fantasy. I don't know, but Dev Patel just came out of nowhere and was like, yeah, I directed it and starred in a movie. That's like, you know, uh, john wick is fuck and it's like all right i'm here for it yeah <laughs> let's do it and apparently like uh universal and jordan peele bought it so that it wouldn't go straight to netflix like oh yeah praise praise them man like that's awesome i love it i love hearing when places go no 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 this needs to be seen theatrically and saves a project like that that's awesome opposite yeah. of what's happening to roadhouse which i'm gonna give a chance i'm okay. i'm i I'm not going to I'm always excited for more Roadhouse. Everyone knows that I'm hesitant because of the MMA thing. But you know what? I'm going to go in open minded. But if Conor McGregor does not say I used to fuck guys like you in prison, that's a disappointment. <laughs> that is, I'll understand if they don't. I won't be upset. I'm just saying you lost an opportunity to say the greatest thing ever. <laughs> yeah, that that is definitely an all timer action movie line. Um, also very excited for the new radio silent joint, uh, Abigail, where it's, uh, it's one of my favorites, kind of a crime horror combo where it's about a bunch of kidnappers, including, uh, American sweetheart, Dan Stevens, and also American sweetheart, Melissa Barrera, uh, kidnapping a young girl who's a ballerina and holding her for ransom. Uh, but the twist is turns out she's a fucking vampire. So they're in some trouble. Wait. Did we adopt Dan Stevens? I thought he was British. Yeah, kind of. I mean, look, he, he's been in enough American movies where he could be America's sweetheart. Did or or, or did or, yeah? Or is he just really good at a British accent? I don't know. I mean, we all know I have a huge crush on Dan Dan Stevens. So yeah, which he's also going to be in my other most anticipated film, Kong uh, Godzilla X Kong: The New <laughs> Empire. Boys oh, are yeah. back in town. Come on, the boys are certainly back in town with dan stevens <laughs> we are also getting the the long-awaited uh follow-up to saint maude from rose glass we're getting love lies bleeding yes! mm-hmm. i know I'm i cannot so wait i cannot wait to see what she does after yeah, saint buddy. maude oh so my that's goodness gonna, and also we're getting maxine yep. the third the third oh, yeah uh, time happening Mia goth yeah so and that's coming. we're getting furiosa yeah. yeah, you know what? There's a lot of franchise movies coming out because we're also getting a new Saw movie. Uh, we're getting oh, yeah. a Already? new. Damn, we're getting a new Alien movie. We get a new Silent Hill movie. We're we're getting a new Smile, a, a sequel to Smile, but also we're getting the first Omen. <laughs> yeah, I didn't I hate that trailer. That. I I'm didn't ducking. hate that trailer. I <laughs> didn't hate that trailer. Listen, listen. I'll give it a chance. Y'all know me. You you know I'm a huge omen stand i watch those movies constantly and my criteria is as long as it's better than the fourth omen movie i'm happy (laughs) mostly because that is a very low bar that's a very very low bar after exorcist believer i'm kind of skeptical about the first omen but i'm gonna watch it i mean Mm. i I, know honestly like if you do watch the i know you're not a trailer guy jay but that trailer gives nothing away which i really appreciate but it also has me going, that was a really good trailer that gave away nothing. Is it because there's nothing to see? But I, I, you know, I'm stoked. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's new Omen. I can't be I can't be mad at that. Uh, again, as long as it's better than the fourth one, that fourth one, it was made for TV. It's it's ugh. we don't need to go down that 
But even, I mean, come on. I love the third Omen movie. That ends with a fucking Bible quote. Come on. Like, <laughs> it ends with two Bible quotes, actually, now that I'm thinking about it, right? Like, damn. I thought we were going to get like a boxing match between the Antichrist and Jesus. And instead we get just like a glowing light and fucking Bible. I love Final Conflict. I'm, I'm sounding like I'm bitching about it, but I love that movie. <laughs> I mean, Sam Neill, man. Sam Neill. A boxing match, like like South Park, a boxing match oh, between Jesus and Satan. And then Classic. Satan bets bets on himself to lose. <laughs> oh, <yeah. the> fight. <laughs> oh, my God. But like uh, that movie's just so good. Sam Neill just like chewing the scenes with the statue of Jesus getting whipped, going, I'm coming for you, Nazarene. Like, come on. Uh, uh, anyways, we're also getting a quiet place uh, day one. This, oh yeah. So yeah this is gonna be a pretty good uh a good year i think for franchise movies oh mm-hmm. speaking of franchise let's not forget kingdom of the planet of the apes oh yeah <laughs> yeah have kingdom of the planet of the apes yes yeah. finally fucking finally we're getting it so i'm hyped is nosferatu this year too yes it is i think it's like tw- like christmas it's towards yeah the end it's of coming out at the at the end of the year yeah 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 so Damn, that's dude. exciting but still, the, a lot of great original movies coming out this year, too, like um, uh, Jane Schoenbrunn, who did uh, I, um, We're All Going to the World's Fair. Uh, her new movie is coming out this year. I saw the TV glow. Been hearing a lot of great stuff about it out of Sundance. And I loved uh, We're All Going to the World's Fair. So I am hyped as hell for it. Hell yeah. It's got Fred Durst. <laughs> oh, you had me until you said Fred Durst. Actually, <laughs> I, I don't mind Fred Durst as a filmmaker or or as an it, it's kind of like Marky Mark. I don't mind him as an actor. Anything that keeps him from doing music, I, I'll support. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I don't know exactly what role he, he, he has. And it. it just says he's got a supporting role, though. Justice Smith and uh, Bridget Lundy Payne are the two leads for the movie. But either way, again, I am just very hyped for it. Yeah, she's she's one of those filmmakers where like just right off the bat, I'm like, I'll I'll watch anything they put out mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. like her, her and Rose Glass, especially like I'm I'm so pumped to see their sophomore picks. I, actually, go back to Rose Glass's new movie. Like, come on, Chris, <laughs> Chris, Kristen Stewart falling in love with a muscle mommy. And it's yes. a thriller. And Ed Harris is her evil crime boss dad with, with a, a mullet. mullet. With the mullet. It's like, why are you checking off all the boxes for me, man? <laughs> I am so impressed with the projects that both Kristen Stewart and Robert Pattinson have chosen uh, in their post Twilight eras. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, because because they could have completely fallen into that little, you know, teen star kind of a thing, you know, and and. But they're not. They're choosing these great indie projects. And honestly, they're knocking it out of the park with them. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know that I've seen a bad performance from either of them. It's it's great because it really highlights how much they weren't that type of actor. You yes. know, they, yeah. they, and it and looking back at the I, I still haven't watched Twilight movies. I'm all set. But like just seeing like the clips and stuff that I have seen, it's like these two are awkward as shit. Like they should not be leading a major franchise. <laughs> that looked like it was a bit much for them, Um, just like in not wanting what they want to do. So them being able to like kind of stretch out and play all these really weird and complex and interesting characters is is beautiful to see. So, yeah, I'm I'm here for them. Um, What about. Uh, going back to genre because we stepped away a little bit. Let's not forget uh, Imaginary, which looks like a hell of a good time. Um, yeah, it looks like it might be fun. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those ones where I'm like, I get the concept, but I'm interested in the execution. I was with that with Megan too, where it's like, I'm I'm here for it, but like, let's see how you execute. And I loved Megan, so like, I'm I'm ready to be, uh, you know, pushed either way. And then, um. What about uh, Alex Garland's Civil War? Um, I'm interested because it's very timely. I'm very interested in that because, well, first of all, it's Alex Garland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, that uh, I think he's going to make some statements with that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, also, I do like how he cast Nick Offerman as the president. I mean, he's got my vote. <laughs> I've read his. If you ever read his books, they're a lot of fun. And like, yeah. I'd you'd get my vote. But I mean, if only to have Megan Mullaney as the uh, first lady, like she would kill it. Um, Well, in terms of uh, upcoming releases, also excited for Lisa Frankenstein coming out in a, in like week or two. Yeah. that That's coming or out next week. Soon. Next week. Yeah. yeah. It's next week. 
Mm. So it'll be it'll be out when this episode comes out. Yes, it will. Yeah. And but I've I've been hyped. I've been really excited for it, and it's really cool that you know uh, Diablo Cody is back in the genre, and even put in the marketing from the writer of uh, Jennifer's Body. Yeah, and Zelda Williams directed it too. Yep, directed by Zelda Williams. Yeah, which she's done a few shorts and stuff. So I'm excited to see what she does. You know, she's always been very outspoken and very out there. So like, I'm very stoked about that. Yeah. Yeah, and between this and poor things, it's just been a real revival of Frankenstein. And oh, dude, we're we're getting so many good like classic monster stuff happening. There's a Wolfman movie coming out later this year, apparently. I would a million times rather see a fresh take on Frankenstein, like Poor Things or Lisa Frankenstein, or a remake of like Nosferatu, like that's coming out, than just another tired zombie movie. Yeah. You know, that I mean, seriously, I I, I mean, maybe it's because Frankenstein or the Invisible Man, those are more intriguing monsters to me. Hmm. But yeah, Hmm. I'm I I mean, I've had zombie fatigue for decades, I feel like. (laughs) Well, the the exception being um, that 28. It was it 28, 28 years, years 28 later. months later. Or is it years? Yeah, yeah they years. Skip months? They, they, they took too they long. Skip months. They took too long. <laughs> um, yeah, it's 28, 28 years later. But apparently uh, Killian Murphy is coming back or at least is uh, producing. Um, I think so. Like it, it's it's ramping up hard now. So I'm like, all right. Yeah. If you get all the boys back, you know, boys are yeah, back. Danny Boyle and Alex Garland. They're, yeah. they're back on it. Boys are back in town. I'm here for it. You know, why not? Um, but yeah, I, I, I do feel you. It's, it's, it is hard to get hyped on a zombie movie, uh, these days, but I mean, I'm, I'm here for all these, you know, reimaginings. I mean, just, I just want to take a moment to reflect how awesome it was that universal put out two Dracula movies last year, like fucking it. <laughs> yeah. And then we're getting a daughter of Dracula movie with Abigail this year. Like I'm loving this investment in Dracula and a Nosferatu remake. Come on. That's pretty dope. That's pretty dope. We We're up to our next in Dracula's. Ah, don't get bit. Eh. Eh. I couldn't resist. <laughs> All right, cool. Let's uh let let's get out of here. Um, so what are you looking forward to that's coming up? Uh, did we miss anything? We probably did because there does seem to be a lot, and there's also a lot of a, a lot of stuff that seems fluid. Like there's supposedly a new Jordan Peele movie, but no one knows anything about it. You know, so, I mean, I'm always there for Jordan Peele. So whatever it is, I'll be there and whenever it is. So let us know what your favorites are or what you're looking forward to most. And uh, maybe we'll talk about them later if it's something that we egregiously forgot. Um, So uh, with that, our uh, theme song is by Restless Spirit. So go check them out. And our artwork is by Chris Fisher. So go check him out. You can find us on all of the socials under Ion Horror or at iHorror.com, which is the website we call home. And uh, yeah, we'll uh, call this one an episode and we will see you in a couple of weeks. So for me, James J. Edwards. I'm Jacob Davison. I'm Jonathan Korea. Keep your eye on horror.